turn out the lights down this end, please. Here we go. Oh, are we not, maybe not all out, but uh, yeah, that's fine. That would be great. Thank you. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. And um, I'm glad my musical accompaniment has died off for the moment. And uh, I, first off, I don't claim to be a total expert in all of this, but I sort of know a bit about it, and I've, I've tried to put together something. Most I see a lot of you here are experienced photographers. So it's geared more to people who are like new members of the club who are wanting to learn a bit about what are these things and how do they work. Thanks, Danny. So very briefly, I've been in photography for a long time and just basically self-taught. I started there when I was nine months old. <laughs> that's, that's me holding a light meter contemplating a shot in, in, in 1958. And uh, my mom told me that the light meter was what got me to stand for the first time. They brought out that light meter and dangled it above me and I stood up to get the light meter. <laughs> so I loved photography from an early age but when I was about eight or nine, my mom and dad bought me a little plastic camera and I took shots of the Air Force helicopters and things like that. Then when I was nine over here, my mom gave me this camera. Her parents had given it to her and then she gave it to me and I used this camera for a number of years. And that's a shot there of me at nine using this camera trying to take a photo probably of the chickens in our yard or our dog or something like that. Then eventually, so I had that camera. I used to dream about these Instamatics that I'd see in National Geographic as a kid, thinking, wow, that must be fantastic. And then I bought one. It feels like a little plastic piece of junk. <laughs> but they were extremely popular, did very well. Everybody and their uncle had one, and that's the little Instamatic. The next step for me was to a 35 millimeter. This was my first 35 millimeter, an Olympus trip in 1977. And from there, well, from there, got a compact 35. This is a full frame camera. Wow. A full frame compact Olympus capsule camera. And then moved on over here to the Olympus OM-1, OM-2, and OM-4. Fantastic 35 millimeter cameras. So that was at that stage over here, roughly, well, from years before, from 1978, I used 35 millimeter and full. Then went digital in, uh, digital, where is it, 2006 with four thirds. And I went with Olympus because I'd used Olympus for so long. And that was a four third sensor. At that stage, I didn't quite fully understand. I knew it was small and that, but I didn't really fully understand what it was. Then in 2010, I bought a full frame, this Nikon. Now what amazes me here, look at this big honking thing. This is also a full frame 35 millimeter, top of the line professional 35 millimeter. These things grew like rhinoceri. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. And so I've used digital from 2003 onwards. Thanks, Danny. So what I love about photography is what I love about architecture as well. To be a good architect, you have to be creative and original, but you also have to have a lot of technical knowledge. If all you are is creative and you design a building, well, forget it. You won't know how to do the waterproofing. You won't know how to do the roof. You won't know how the footings work. So architecture combines creativity, original thought, as well as technical knowledge, uh, skill, and so on. And Photography does exactly the same thing. Thanks, Danny. You have to have technical knowledge. If you, want to, if you have no clue how to use your camera and all you do is grab your camera and go out and take snapshots, you're never going to improve. So if you want to improve, you have to develop a certain level of technical knowledge. And it reminds me of what Jason Stitt said at one of our meetings, I think last year, talking about editing. And he said, you have to learn how to edit. If you don't know how to edit your photographs, you are never going to improve. Just like in the days of old when you had dark rooms, I could never afford a dark room. Same with photography. And these are three essential necessary elements that we have to understand in order to improve our photography. Focal length, depth of field, 
And then how in the world does that relate to sensor sizes in these cameras? So first of all, what is focal length? I'm, I'm just going to breeze through this quite quickly. Focal length is a, an optical property of the lens itself. And it measures how the lens converges and focuses light. That's a positive focal length. Or it measures how the lens diverges light. That would be a negative focal length. Focal length. So very basically, you have a simple lens. Light comes in, and it is focused to a point. That distance is called the focal length. So if you have a 50 millimeter focal length, that, and it gets pretty confusing in a way because half these things are measured in inches, and four by five. And then in another round, we talk, oh, six by nine, oh, but that's centimeters or millimeters or whatever. And then you've got 35 millimeters and eight by tens and what have mm. you. So focal lengths are measured in millimeters. Thanks, Dan. In our cameras, though, there's not just a single lens. Well, in this little Instamatic, there's one tiny little plastic lens in here, but not in our other cameras. There are multiple lens group or elements in groups, and this is your typical lens. The light comes in, it goes through all these elements. Inside there, you have an aperture. The aperture is like the pupil in your eye. In a dark room like this, if you could see my eyes, my pupils are probably quite big. If I look to the light here, my pupils will shrink. That's what your aperture does. Let's in more light, let's in less light, depending on how you set it. Then, in that whole group of lenses, it has what is called an optical center. That's where it, it because the image in your camera is actually upside down. You see it the right way up, but it's flipped inside the camera, upside down. So you have the optical center of your lens, then the same focal length. So instead of just one big lens, multiple little lenses with an optical center and a focal length. And that focuses it inside the body of the camera onto the sensor or onto film. And we have some members of the club who use film as well. So the point on that is a 50 millimeter lens, like the one on this camera, this is a 50 millimeter lens regardless of the body you put it on. If uh, I've done shots the other day with taking this lens and putting it with an adapter onto my micro four thirds. It's still a 50 millimeter lens. It doesn't change the optical properties of that lens. And there's hordes of confusion over that. But a 50 millimeter is always a 50 millimeter regardless of the body you put it on. So why is focal, lens, focal length important? Because it dictates the angle of view of the lens, like how much the lens sees is governed by the focal length. Thanks, Danny. So here's what it does. The angle of view, now I'll discuss, I'll, I'll, I'll get into field of, field of view, and these are these technical terms, later when we look at sensor sizes. But the angle of view of a lens is determined by the focal length. So a short focal length, you'll, he you'll hear people say, I've got a long lens, or I've got a short lens. A short lens means short focal length, like 24 millimeters. That means it's got a wide angle of view. A long focal length, like 300 millimeters, that means it's got a long focal length, a narrow field of view, it's more like a telescope. So that's to show you here. A 24 millimeter wide angle. Now, when I say 24, I'm talking about the standard 35 millimeter, or as they call it today, a full frame. And we'll see what that is later. So the shorter your focal length, the wider your angle of view, and it pushes stuff away. So I could stand here with a 24 millimeter and get you all in. But if I put in a 300 or a 400 millimeter, I would maybe just get the width of one of, Char of Charla's glasses from the same position because it's more like a telescope. So that's what the angle of view is de determined by the focal length of the lens. So to choose the right lens, if you want to go out and go, oh, I'm going to go out and do some photography, how do you know what lens to choose? If you don't know, well, what focal length am I going to need to shoot this particular thing? So like here, I had a chance a few years ago to go glider flying in an ancient old glider in California. 
When I was up there, I began to wonder because it was a tin box about 50, 60 years old. <laughs> but I couldn't take my whole camera bag. I could only take one camera, one lens in the glider. So I could, and I didn't want to be changing lenses while we we're trying to fly. So what did I do? I had to think about, well, what focal length do I need? I knew I'd want to get shots where I'd want to get the panel and the outside landscape in, in focus. So to do that, I chose the equivalent of a 14 to 24, a wide angle zoom. And this is not the lens, that's a canopy, sort of reflections in the canopy. Thanks, Dan. Here, when you go and do motocross, two, well, well, what focal length do you use? Do you use a wide angle? Do you use a telephoto? Here, to do this sort of thing, I knew before I got there, I looked at my lenses, I thought, okay, I want the 70 to 300 the, in terms of a full frame. This was a full frame. So the 70 to 300 gives me a narrow to a narrower field of view, like a slight telescope to more of a telescope to shoot something like that. And if I had no clue about focal length, I may have walked out there with my wide angle zoom and got there and man, I can't even see these bikes because <laughs> the lens is not enabling me to in effect get close enough to my subject. So lenses are categorized by focal lengths. And again, we're talking 35 millimeter or full frame sensors. In the middle there, you have what is called a standard lens. In the old days, when you bought a camera, it came with a 50 millimeter lens. But the 50 millimeter sits right in the middle here. And on a full frame sensor or a 35 millimeter, the range of focal length is 35 to 70 millimeters. So any lens within that range is referred to as a standard lens. And why? Because if I'm standing here and I'm looking at Keith, to my eyes, he looks about that far away, you know, whatever. But if, if I come with this camera now with a 50 millimeter lens and I look at Keith, I could open this eye and that eye and he looks about the same distance away. The standard lens gives a sort of field of view similar to what you see with your eyes. If I took this little Instamatic and I come and look at Keith, it's like, whoa, it's pushed him far away because it's got a wider angle lens. So what they mean by a standard lens is a lens that gives a view that looks kind of like you would see with your eye at 50 millimeters. Anything less than that starts going to, so if I put a, a shorter focal length, I'd get more of you, more of you, more of you. With a fish eye, I could stand here and get everybody in and you'd look miles away. With a, with a telephoto, narrower, 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 until I would see Keith's iris, and that's it, with a 400 millimeter or something. So that's how lens are, lenses are categorized. You have standard, 35 to 70, Wide angle, 24 to 35. Ultra wide, less than 24 millimeters. And then telephotos, 70 to 300 is a telephoto. Greater than 300 is a super telephoto. So here are photographs with that sort of thing. There's a super wide fitting in everything from my table. A wide, a standard telephoto and a super telephoto of a what prairie dog, I think it was, at Badlands. Thanks, Dan. Mm. So years ago, when you bought a camera, when I bought this camera, it came with the 50 millimeter lens. Back in the day, nearly every time you bought an SLR, you got a 50 with it. The pro camera stores, which we didn't have in town, there you could buy just a body. But most of the stores, the regular stores where I bought, you got the camera and the lens. So. It, at this time, you got a standard lens, which gave you a standard view like your eyes. And the first thing I noticed when I used one of these for the first time and I put it to my eye, I was like, wow, everything's not so far away. <laughs> because I was used to a little camera with a wide angle lens that pushed everything away. And this enabled me to get up right close and focus or further away. I mean, it's a fantastic lens. So these days, of course, 
When you buy a DSLR or a mirrorless camera, you often get a fairly inexpensive little zoom. And it's usually slow. And when you say a lens is slow, you mean it's got small lenses, small aperture. You can't open it very wide and work well in low light. Whereas these 50s, this is a 1.8. It's a very fast lens. It's got a big aperture and it opens wide. So this is just to show you now these are photographs I've taken digital shots with 50 millimeters to show you the versatility. That's why they called it a nifty 50, because you could use it for all sorts of things. And your feet are the zoom. We've gotten a quite lazy where we just want to stand and zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, <laughs> zoom out, zoom in. Whereas here, I had to walk. I had to get close to Aaron to do that. I had to walk to the back of the church. And, and being a big aperture, low light, I took this at, it was actually the circumcision of a friend of mine who married a Jewish lady and converted to Judaism. And they circumcised the baby and the dad was there holding him and with his hand holding his foot, I just thought it looked beautiful. It does. Because it's I had beautiful. a 50 millimeter 1.4 on this camera in low light, I could walk up and boom, shoot it right there. Couldn't do it with this zoom because the aperture's not big enough. Again, the nifty 50, enabled me to do all of those. Thanks, Danny. Here are a few more shots, all with the same 50 millimeter lens. To show you now, on the right down there, I have no idea how I did that. <laughs> I did that years ago when I was learning a bit of Photoshop, and, and I've got to figure out how I did that. I don't know. <laughs> but these are all 50 millimeter lens shots. So with the lens that typically came with an SLR. Thanks, Danny. Now, here's to show you the effects of focal length from the same position. This is the Badlands where I was just a few months ago. So I was shooting this valley at sunset, and I shot a couple of shots, but I shot different focal lengths from the same position. So there's how my eye saw it at 50 millimeters. That's about how far it looked. In there, you can see a tree. There's a speck there, that's a tree. Then I went to 24 millimeters, and you could see, I can see all this stuff in front of me that I couldn't see here because it has a much wider angle of view. Then I zoomed in to 300 millimeters, and look at that tree. There's the tree, there's the tree, and there you can only see it in Lightroom when you zoom in and you see a tiny little speck there, and that's the tree. So, all of those were from exactly the same position. And again, if I, if I went out to do this, I was on a trip, I was limited in what I could carry. I took one little camera bag. So before I left, I had to consider, now what am I going to shoot? What range of focal lengths do I think I need to shoot? For example, in past years, I've carried my macro a lot. I don't think I've ever used my macro on any of my trips. So the last few trips, I've left it at home. And then I've chosen, the, the, here I chose the lenses I thought I would need based on the focal lengths and suited me fine. Thanks, Danny. So remember, in, in summary so far, focal length is an optical property of the lens. And lenses are categorized by focal lengths. The 50 millimeter is a very versatile, useful lens. If you don't have one, and we'll get into focal lengths or equivalences later, but you can buy them very cheaply. A 50 millimeter 1.8 costs, I don't know, next to nothing compared to these other lenses. Mm. So it would be a worthy, because I often challenge myself where I'm like, what am I gonna do? It's a gloomy day. I'll put one lens on my camera, walk around my suburb or my neighborhood, looking for things to photograph, challenging myself to use just this one lens. And it's, I love it. And focal length, so we've learned it's a property of the lens. Lenses are categorized by focal length and it determines the angle of view. A shorter focal length is wide, a longer focal length is like a telescope. Now, why this is important is because this all relates to depth of field. And for those who are new who may not know what depth of field is, I, I drew these diagrams to kind of explain it. Assume you are here with a camera. 
You've got someone standing here and you've got some bushes and trees behind you. In your camera, you have the aperture, which is like your pupil. You have a lens, which has a focal length. And then you have distance to your subject, distance to the background. And when you focus in, and say you focus on the person's face, that person's face will be in focus, and there's a range behind them and a range in front of them that is in acceptable focus, and then it gets more and more blurred. That range of acceptable focus is called the depth of field. And you can vary that to get different effects. And all of these factors, focal length, aperture, distance to subject, distance to background, influence the depth of field. For example, if you think, I want to take a shot of Amy, and I want to blur the background, and I think I'm going to do it with a zoom, with a tiny little aperture, and if there's a wall right behind you. If the wall's too close to the back of Amy, nothing I can do will blur that wall, really, because it's too close. It fall, the wall is falling into this range of acceptable focus. So unless you understand a little bit about how it works, it doesn't matter what you do, you're not going to get it done. Thanks, Danny. So if you want to increase the depth of field, there are a couple of ways. So you want to make it deeper. You, you've got like, remember that shot I showed you of the glider? I wanted to have the instrument panel and the landscape in focus. To do that, I used a super wide because a super wide angle lens by nature has a deep depth of field. So if I use that lens with a small aperture, boom, I can get everything in focus. So if you want to increase your depth of field, shorter focal length, smaller aperture, and consider the distance, and lo and behold, you can get just about everything in focus. Thanks, Dan. If you want to, you've seen a lot of portrait shots and flower shots where the background's all blurred. To do that, it's the reverse. To decrease the depth of field and get it very narrow and make the image look almost three-dimensional, you need a longer focal length, you need a larger aperture, and you can reduce your distance to the subject. So, and there are various sort of tricks you can do. For example, this lens does not have a big aperture, but it's a powerful zoom. So, one of the features is use a longer focal length. So if, if I was out and all I had was this camera and I'm like, man, I want to take a portrait of Amy again, but I've only got this lens. How can I blur the background? Go a bit further away, zoom in, take, unlock it, zoom in to the max of 300. So I'm using a very long focal len length and bang, I can get a shot of Amy and probably pretty nicely blur the background. So it, it works best if you can vary all three to suit what you want, but there are ways to a point around it. If you don't have the right lens, you can reduce the distance to the subject, use a larger aperture, use a longer focal length, and you'll blur that background beautifully. Thanks, Danny. So this too is a, it's something you need to understand, and this is how depth of field relates to focal length. An ultra wide, the red box there just represents depth of field. So by nature, an ultra wide lens has a very deep depth of field. You can get everything in focus. A wide has a slightly less, it, this is same aperture, same position, same focus point. The depth of field gets narrower as the focal length gets longer. You can see that prairie dog, there's nothing in focus. Just the prairie dog and boom, it just, the background just disappears because I'm using a very long focal length. The railroad tracks, I focused here and they start getting blurry, but they're not as blurry as a prairie dog because I wasn't using quite as long a focal length. So you have to know this because if you think, okay, someone's asked me to come and do portrait shots and I grab my wide angle lens and I go out thinking, I'm going to do lovely portrait shots with beautiful bokeh. Well, not going to happen because you've got the wrong focal length. So to Im improve that area of your photography, you need to understand, and it, 
we'll, I'll put this up in a present, in like handout or something so you can refer to it because I'm sure it's possibly for some information overload. But you have to understand this. And if you do, your photography is going to go up. Um, can you put it up on the website? Yes, what I'll have to, to do is make it, I'll remake it into like a PDF, a PDF handout of, of the major elements and then mm -hmm. I'll put that up. So and we could put the, um, the slideshow itself up on our Google Docs site because our, our camera yeah. club has a Google Docs okay. site that's Oops, accessible. Sorry, I, I'd so. rather keep going otherwise I'll keep yeah. it too long. But, um, so, uh, so that was, uh, sorry Danny, can you just go back one? Let me just, yeah, so depth of field increases as focal length, I mean, sorry, depth of field decreases as focal length increases. The more powerful your lens like a telescope, the shallower the depth of field. The wider your lens, the deeper the depth of field. Thanks. And the other major factor that affects it is your aperture. The smaller your aperture, so the smaller you make your aperture, the deeper the depth of field. Here's an aperture in the middle that gets a little wider. Here's like that lens on that Olympus, f1.8, open wide. The depth of field is very shallow. So you can know, okay, I want to get this distance. I want a big aperture, and boom, you can blur the, blur the background and so on. Or if I want to get everyone in focus, go back a little further, smaller aperture, focus on Amy, and I'll get more of you in focus. So it's a relationship with focal length, aperture, and the distance to the subject and the distance to the background behind it. Next. So here's depth of field. There you are, David. <clears throat> this was at the Christmas shoot about Last, three, years yeah, three years ago. So I saw David shooting and I thought, man, I want to get a shot of him. And I knew I want to blur the background and the lights behind him couldn't be too close or you'd see all the lights. And I, I realized I wanted to get a few layers of lights. So I, while he was shooting, I just moved till I got these lights on the tree and the lights across the street. So you can see how these are a little more distinct. The, the, the shape of them is made by the shape of the aperture blades in the lens. But you can see how beyond him, they're a little bit distinct, they're less distinct, and then it's just blurry. So if you know that, hey, this is the effect I want, choose the right focal length, choose the aperture, get where you, boom, and shoot it, and you can do that quite easily. Thanks, Danny. So summary so far. Focal length is a property of the lens. Lenses are categorized by focal length. Depth of field is affected by focal length, aperture, distance to subject, distance to background. Now we come to the fun stuff. Like the, the <laughs> stuff that gets all sorts of confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the easy. <laughs> <laughs> because the lens you choose, so the <clears throat> lens we choose influences the angle of view and the depth of field. But <clears throat> the size of the film and or sensor size impacts that to a degree. And I, I'll attempt to explain that. Uh, thanks, Dan. So looking at film, just very briefly, because some of the members still, as I say, use film. You, you thought it was bad with just four thirds and APS-C and full frame. Well, film had <laughs> hordes, hordes <laughs> of different types, different sizes, and the same film used for different formats, and some measured in millimeters, some measured in inches. I, I enjoyed reading about it all, <laughs> but it was, I mean, I just thought, wow, I didn't realize I used a few of these. I used 620 as a boy in that camera, and I used 126, and I'd seen, so, oh, and I used 35 millimeter, and I'd seen some of the others, but I didn't realize it was all that stuff. And some of them, 1901 to still being made today. Thanks, Danny. So I'd, I've got a CAD system at home. So I drew out these negatives sizes at actual size. <clears throat> so we could see what are the relative sizes. That stuff is all film. This is digital. Wow. Now camera manufacturers have made a, done a wonderful thing with advertising and they've gotten everybody to think, oh, well, you've got to have a full frame. One day you'll get a full frame and then you'll be a real photographer because unless you have a full frame, you're not really a real photographer. 
And the whole joke is, that's a full frame, really? <laughs> my Kodak Junior was sick, took shots at 60 by 80. I didn't know that as a 14 year old, I was doing medium format photography <laughs> with this camera. It's about, uh, what, five and a half times the size of, of the 35 millimeter full frame. <laughs> so, <clears throat> there, <clears throat> There's your 30, 35 was invented in about 1930, I think, or so. And what happened? It became extremely popular. And the 120 format, the medium format, became the realm of professionals with their Hasselblads and Bronicas and Mamias or whatever they are. All those fancy cameras that we, like, me as a boy, I was like, oh, man, I wish I had a camera like that. But I could never afford it. <clears throat> so. The 35 millimeter became extremely popular. And because of that, that's why everybody started relating format sizes to 35 millimeter. And if you look at digital, here are the major digital formats that we use. Four thirds, which is like that little Olympus. It is basically the same size as 110 Instamatic film, which I never really knew. I knew it was small, but I had never really compared it with film. APS-C comes from the advanced photographic system that was developed, I think, in the late 80s and 90s, had a short life and died. It, the, the APS-C sensors in Canon and Nikon are almost identical to the APS advanced uh, photographic system that used to exist. Then full frame is 24 by 35 relates to the 35 millimeter. You can get medium format digitals, well, from six, seven thousand dollars to who knows, you can pay 50. They don't even advertise the price for some of these fancy <laughs> alphas. It's price on request. <laughs> and they're 20, 30, 40 thousand dollar cameras. Wow. Thanks, Danny. So here's a photograph I took with that old Kodak of my brother in 1972 when I was 14. So this is a medium format shot. Just the negative is 5.56 times bigger than a full frame camera. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. So you have many different sensor sizes and 30, with 35 millimeter becoming very popular, it became the standard to which people equate things to. So you will have often heard people say, well, I've got this lens on my Olympus that equates to this on a Nikon uh, on a full frame. That is why, because 35 became so popular that other formats were then compared to 35 because everyone knew if you said, I've got a 24 millimeter, if you've done photography for a while, or you just know that's a wide angle lens. But if I say with my four thirds, I've got a 24 millimeter, it's not a 24, it's a 48 with a conversion factor. So the standard became 35. And in digital, 35 millimeter sensors, they just called full frame, but it really is meaningless. I mean, it's not, you look at the others, it's like full frame of what? My four thirds is full frame. Your Canon or Nikon DX is full frame. Just depends on the size of the frame. To choose the right lens though, you need to understand crop factor. So you need to know what type of camera you have. Is it a full frame? Is it a crop sensor? And then if it is a crop sensor, what type of crop sensor? How big? What is it? Thank you. So I made a little CAD model here to try and illustrate this crop factor. This is, so consider now, this is a full frame camera, 35 millimeter format with a 50 millimeter lens on it the light comes in and it flips the image upside down. And the lens, the lens doesn't cast a square image. If you look through binoculars, right, the, the image is round. Well, the, the image cast by your lens is also round. It's called an image circle. And the field of view is basically across that. And as you can see, it casts a circle bigger, a little bigger than the sensor. The sensor itself on a 35 millimeter full frame, that width is the field of view. So 50 millimeter, 
on a full frame camera will let me see the whole scene like that. Now, if I flip to a Nikon or Canon sensor, and Nikon or Canon on their crop sensor cameras, they, they both have slightly different sizes. So the factor on a Nikon is 1.5, the factor on a Canon is 1.6, because the sensors are slightly different. But what it, what it basically means is, and this is why they call it a crop sensor, it's in effect cropping that piece because that's, all, that's the size of the sensor. It can't fit anymore. So because the sensor is physically smaller. Thanks, Danny. If I put on my Olympus camera, its sensor is even smaller. So with the same lens on the camera, at the same scene, same location, you see even less. So it's like, oh dear, how do I, but I want to see the whole scene, what do I do? That's where you have to understand focal length and crop factor. So I had a 50 on there, crop factor for Olympus is two, so I would need to put a 25. If I popped a 25 millimeter, shorter focal length, wider field of view, I would fit the entire scene. And I've got some examples to show you that that I shot this afternoon. Oh, so here are all three of them combined. There would be your full frame sensor. There's your Canon or Nikon cropped sensor. And there's your Olympus four thirds. Just to show you how, yes, Sandra. Is, is, sorry, is what? No, no, no. This is a property of the body of your camera, the size of sensor. Sorry? No, no, it's just the way the camera is. If, like, doesn't matter what I do to this camera, it's got a small sensor. So my focal length, if I put a 24 on this, it would look like a 48, and I'd see even less. If I wanted the equivalent of a 24 on this, I'd have to put a 12 millimeter on it. Then it's got a wide field of view, and boom, it fits it all on the sensor, and I see exactly the same thing. But it, it, it can be a little bit confusing, but hopefully with a handout too, and looking at it will help. So the, I know most of you have either, your crop sensors are either uh, Canon or Nikon, and there are a few of us with Olympus, but these are the crop factors. For a Nikon DX, it's 1.5. For a Canon APS-C, it's 1.6. For a four thirds camera, it's two. So as I say here, if you, if you, you multiply the focal length of the lens you're using, to get the equivalent field of view. So if you were to take this 50 millimeter lens and put it on your, with an adapter on your Canon crop sensor, 50 millimeter times 1.6 equals, what's that, 78 or something, you'd get the field of view of a 78 millimeter. And if I put that same lens, which is a 50 millimeter onto my Olympus, the crop factors too, because the sensor is even smaller it would give me the field of view of a 100 millimeter on a full frame camera. So it would be like a nice portrait view. So I'm hoping <laughs> it may be a little confusing, but that's how you figure it out with, for your Canon or your Nikon. And that, why it's important is again, if you're gonna go and shoot motocross, well, what focal length? You need to look at your lens and say, hey, do I have a powerful enough lens to enable me? <clears throat> and to look at that, you look at the focal length, you multiply it by the crop factor, and you can see, ah, oh, yes, it gives me the equivalent of a 300 millimeter or 400 millimeter, I'll be able to get good shots. Thanks, Danny. Alan? Yes. There's even a smaller sensor size available on what's called bridge. Oh, yes. I mean, I haven't gone. Phones and everything get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So I've tried to just cover the sensors that people use, full, uh, that most would use, full frame, Nikon or Canon. Oh, well then, but it would work the same principle. You just have to know what is the crop factor. Then you can see, oh, I'm getting the equivalent of X lens. Now, the question would be, say for this exercise, Okay, I know that how to work out a crop factor for a given lens to see what it, it would look like on my camera. What if I want on my camera now 
to have something that gives me the field of view of a 50 millimeter on a full frame. That is just the reverse. Instead of multiplying, you divide the focal length. So you would say, okay, 50 millimeters on a crop sensor camera, a Nikon is 1.5. So you take a Nikon, you divide by 50, divided by 1.5, you get 33 millimeters. So if you want to try and use a 50 millimeter at the museum and you've got a Nikon DX camera, and say you've only got a zoom, just rotate your zoom till you hit approximately 33 millimeters and leave it there. Then you are seeing the field of view of a nifty 50 and you can use that to try and get a few shots. If you have a Canon, because it's got a slightly different size sensor, its crop factor is 1.6. So you take 50, you divide by 1.6, and you get 31 millimeters. So on your zoom lens, you just zoom to 31 millimeters, then you're seeing the equivalent of a 50 millimeter lens. And on my Olympus, because it's even smaller, the crop factor is two, I take 50, divide by two, I get 25. So I need to pop on a 25 millimeter lens or zoom back to 25, then I'm seeing a nifty 50. And I'll show you some examples. <clears throat> oh, oh, sorry. Uh, here, this too, in a handout, I'll make this as a handout, it'll help you as well. These are the lens categories, standard, wide, ultra wide, standard telephoto, super telephoto. And I've done it for, there is a full frame. Oh, Less than 24, 24 to that, blah, 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 blah. Here is a Nikon DX camera. So instead of 24, less than 16, 16 to 23. 20, so, and the nifty 50 would be 31. There's Canon, less than 15, 15 to 22. So that would help you if you look, if you've got a crop sensor camera, you can use this to see, now what would a super telephoto be? If you wanna buy a lens and you wanna buy a super telephoto for your DX camera, you can look at this and see, okay, I want to buy a lens that has a focal length of a, a greater than 188 or greater. Then you will have the equivalent field of view of a super telephoto on a full frame camera. And on a four thirds, it's double. The four thirds, the Nikon is easy because it's 1.5 and four thirds is easy because it's two. Canon is a bit of a pain because it's 1.6. <clears throat> okay, thanks, Danny. So here I took these today to try and illustrate the point. This is a Nikon Z6. I set everything the same. Same ISO, same aperture, same shutter speed, because so, people say, oh, well, a, my, a small sensor doesn't gather as much light. You've got to have double the aperture. Uh, absolute garbage. The, these are, they're talking about if you want to get in a certain location and get the exact same field of view, then you, but, but if you take the same lens from the same position, same ISO, same aperture, which I did here, there's no difference, except full frame at 50. Here's 50 on my Olympus, crop factor of two. So in effect, like I showed you on that diagram, how it crops it out, the sensor is smaller. So it's seeing a smaller portion of the same image. So in effect, a 50 millimeter on the Olympus gives me a very nice field of view of 100, which is very nice for portraits. Thanks, Danny. Here's another one I tried. There's a Z6, full frame, 50 millimeters, Olympus E1 Mark III, 50 millimeters. So it gives the effect, the field of view of a 100. But Everything's the same, same aperture, same ISO. I tried to focus on that leaf, focus on that leaf, and it makes it look closer because it's cropping out that, filling the sensor with that because the sensor's smaller and giving me a tighter field of view. So now I did a che check to say, okay, remember I said you can figure out, but what if I want a 50 millimeter view on my four thirds? Take 50, divide by two, boom, 25, and then the next one, here now, <clears throat> same shot with my Z6, 50 millimeters, focusing on that. Here's the Olympus with a 25 millimeter lens. So divide by two, half the crop factor, put on a 25 millimeter lens, the photos look all but identical. There's a very... Uh, Except for depth of field. 
Yes, that's what, a, I was, that's, that's what I was, what I was about to say. There's a very subtle difference because, remember, depth of field is impacted by focal length. To get the same field of view, I had to put on a shorter focal length. So it was, and I shot at the same aperture, so it made it the depth of field Deep. a little deeper. Right. Right. So you can see the house in the background here is more dis sorry more distinct than the house in the background there for the same field of view. Thanks. Very interesting. So, and this is why those of us who have these have advantages for birds and animals and stuff. I sat in my garage door and I shot the rain gauge from about 15 foot away, 300 millimeters with both cameras. So there's my full frame, 300 millimeter lens focusing on the, uh, the rainwater gauge. Same position, Olympus, 300 millimeters. Because it's a cropped sensor, it in effect gives me the field of view of a 600. So it's wonderful for photographing things like this where you can in effect get a lot closer because of that crop sensor giving you a tighter field of view and filling the sensor with that. Thanks. There's the corner of the fence. Same position. I, I shot at the corner of the fence with my full frame at 300 millimeters. It's getting all this stuff in. There's the rain gauge, the support for the rain gauge. My crop sensor camera gave me that right off. So it's a tremendous advantage when you, come in, when you come to want to shoot birds and things using a crop sensor camera with a powerful telephoto. Thanks, Danny. So very basically, what we've seen then is focal length is a property of the lens. Lenses are categorized by focal length. Um, depth of field is affected by focal length, distance to subject, distance to background, aperture, and sensor size dictates the field of view that you actually see when you put the lens on the camera. And then crop factors help us determine what lens do we want to use. If we want a wide angle, what do I need to buy? What do I need to use? Or a telephoto, what's the best to use? And then the Nifty 50 is a standard, wonderful lens that can be used for all sorts of stuff and you can emulate it on your crop sensor camera just by figuring out the equivalent va value. Thanks, Danny. Thanks, Danny. So, it, it's probably a bit of information overload, and I'll put together a handout over the next couple of days to try and help. But to improve your photography, you've really got to study, well, the more you would study and understand some of this, it'll help you tremendously in improving your photography. Because instead of just grabbing a lens and kind of shooting in the dark, you'll know, oh wait, I need to do this, so I need a focal length of about that. Or, hey, I've got to do a portrait. I need a deep depth of field, so I need a lens with a big aperture and so on. And it helps you choose the right tool for the job. Yes? Just given my powerful wood reach, buy more lenses. No, the, the problem is actually- And more cameras. <laughs> Uh, related to that, I, I attended a workshop hosted by Scott Birch some years ago, and he's, he's got an excellent article on, the, well, I've just got to buy a new lens. <laughs> and he, he talks about that, and he said that, um, his quote, I may get it wrong, but it's something like 99% of, of all lenses are better, or oh, sorry, yeah, 99% of all lenses are better than 98% of all photographers. <laughs> because I see it online all the time. People are like, this lens is useless. This lens, there's, there's a, a lens made for the Olympus, uh, uh, 100 to 200, I think. Or, oh no, uh, it's short to long. It's a relatively inexpensive lens. I took it with me to, um, where did I go? Badlands. And people all the time in the Olympus groups, this lens is soft, this lens is useless on the long end. I mean, biggest load of garbage out. It's because they don't realize when they zoom into 400 or 200 millimeters, they are in effect using a 400 millimeter lens, handheld and snapping like this. <laughs> and it's soft, it's soft. And I'm like, give me a break. So, 
exactly. <laughs> but I, so the biggest thing that people blame is, my lens is no good, my lens is no good. Well, that little 50 millimeter lens shows that even with a basic fixed lens, you can have great fun with it and get great photographs. And because it has a big aperture, you can blur your background and get beautiful results. And uh, yes, it is because of the crop factors, it's more difficult to blur the background from the same position with the same effective field of view because you have to change to a shorter focal length. And that, that lens that one chart I had shows, a shorter focal length, by nature has more depth of field. But on the other hand, I've got a little album on my photography Facebook page showing this where I said, who needs razor thin depth of field? I mean, being a bit facetious, but yes, it, it is useful. But for example, I've taken lots of portrait shots of my mom and dad over the years with my Nikon, 50 millimeter 1.8 and 85 millimeter 1.4, and with my Olympus. And the problem there is, say you're my mom and dad, and we have <laughs> I'll focus because I've got, so I'll focus on your face, but your face is maybe one inch mm -hmm. behind. Okay, you miss it. And then you get it, your Nikon on your Lightroom and you look, you're nice and sharp, your face is soft. And it's like, brother, it's, it's, he was only like one inch difference. And then that same shot, I've done tests, then using my Olympus, boom, both beautifully sharp, but yes, you see more of the background. So it's advantages and disadvantages. Some people say, well, if you change sensor sizes, it affects the depth of field. Garbage. So you're telling me if there's a 50 millimeter lens shining on this sensor, and you take that sensor out and you slide in another sensor, oh, the depth of field changes. And people say that all the time, utter nonsense. The field of view, you can zoom in on the shots I took there, and when you zoom in on the Olympus, you'll see the depth of field on that is it, the background looks identical. It's just you're seeing a tighter shot. It, it looks to me change, like you just, you could crop the same, you could take the same photo and crop it. You and could. And then have the crop sensor photo. You, you could. Okay. You could. But uh, is you, it going to affect it, pixels it depends, and that yes. kind of stuff? Okay. Then you're blowing it up. And Thank unless you. you've got a super number of pixels, you're losing those pixels. Right. And I often get a better result using my Olympus, especially for telephoto, mm -hmm. than shooting it with my Nikon and the birds this big and trying to crop it. Right. But... Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Whereas here, with a crop sensor, it focuses all those pixels onto the target. And yes, it's smaller. But as you know from, say, the shots I usually submit, because it's smaller, much easier to carry and so on, I carry my Olympus much more than my heavy gear because it's compact. Sure. Yes. The lenses are smaller because they don't have to project as yes, big as an big image, image circle. circle. Yes. Mm -hmm. If you see this, for those of you who know Nikon full frame, this is the equivalent of the Nikon uh, 24 to 70. Mm. The 24 to 70 is one of my most used ranges. This particular lens, equivalent of 24 to 70, is my most used lens in my Olympus system. Comparing it with the Nikon, I mean, it's yeah. at least double the weight and nearly twice the size. But every format has advantages and disadvantages. I was just lucky over the years, I kind of ended up with both and I've just kept both. So anyway, that's it basically. Hopefully, haven't kept you too long. And, and uh, Thank you, Alan. See you. Thank that you. was awesome. All right, and that's break, five minutes, and then we'll have our photo critique, and our famous pet photographer will be leading our Thanks, critique Tim. tonight. All right. So. Hopefully, we'll have a lot of puppy photos. <laughs>